What is beauty for you, Isaac? Well, I think, you know, that beauty is a kind of complicated concept, you know, but I know that I think that it signifies perhaps something quite different for me as it does, say, to the dominant culture. And I think that's because of where I guess I'm positioned in the dominant culture. But I think that in my work, what I've tried to do is to um, utilize it as a kind of weapon, you could say. Um, when I say that, I'm, I mean in a kind of weapon against what I perceive as the ways in which in kind of, well, the cultures that I grew up, but just more in global culture, there is a whole kind of hierarchy um, around the notions of that subject beauty, but also I think in relationship to topic matters, which I cover in my work, there's a way in which um, it's perhaps seen as transgressive or a scene as not being serious. If you try to tackle subjects with um, those aesthetics in play. So sometimes I'm doing it in a contradictory way where I really want to confuse categories. Other times I'm utilizing it as I said, a kind of like weapon in the sense that I want to try to um, not only second guess the audience, but also play with audiences' assumptions um, around the treatment of certain topics or themes. And also, I think there's a way in which there's a kind of, well, I think, you know, that how it's perceived by, let's say, critics you know, they're not usually from my, shall I say, racial group. <laughs> I think, you know, um, it's seen as, you know, some, uh, as a kind of point that, of disagreement or, um, or sometimes, of hate, you know, so I realize all those things. 14 persone completamente debilitate. the kind of regimes and representations of how um, beauty and all of those have been marked, you know, in the dominant culture. And then when you have someone who's not from that culture or from that group that make works, then they have, in a way, according to the question of aesthetic agendas or categories, you know, and I think I'm doing that in my work. Um, so that's probably long, we did answer to your question. <laughs> but you said you don't use it as a tool. You use it as a tool maybe related to the, the, the time, the period, and the aesthetics and the way that your protagonists want to be seen and what fits to them. 
I think quite often, yeah. So in the case of Lucas Langston, we're talking about the high Renaissance. We're talking about the time of um, high modernism in um, black culture in American society. It's a kind of time of a manifesto of the new Negro movement in terms of um, the new Negro as a kind of, let's call it art form. And a lot produced a manifesto. There's a lot of, there's a kind of aesthetic calling, you could say. And similar, I think if we think about um, Frederick Douglass, you know, the whole question around imaging, this is really important. I was trying to right the wrongs of the ways in which a whole group of people are being um, demeaned in the pictorial regime of that time. So I think, you know, you have, so I think in my work earlier on, at least, this was something which was really a concern. And I think, yes, I mean, there's a whole aesthetical agenda. So would you say that that lessons of the hour it's the right moment to see it now? It's kind of you know touching a nerve in American culture in relationship to all of the ramifications that have taken place. And so yeah, and I mean it's not that one plans these things, but that it you know I think it's work, but is. Also, at the same time, a demanding work. It is a work that is aesthetically beautiful. I mean, Frederick Douglass was a philosopher of aesthetics as well as being an orator um, for um, the ab abolition of slavery. You know, he was a slave and he um, wrote about it in an incredible manner. So, you know, but also at the same time, he wrote about photography, you know, almost 70 years before Walter Benjamin. Um, so I think there's a way in which there's something that's so interesting about him. And in a way, I think there's a way that he expresses an unfulfilled sort of mission, you know, in American culture that is still in its... Well, I mean, I think Douglas would be really surprised about the debates that are taking place in America today, um, 200 years on, you know, so...
11 days and a half gone and I have crossed 3,000 miles of the perilous deep. Instead of the bright blue sky of America, I am covered with soft gray fog. I breathe and lo, the chattel becomes a man. I gaze around in vain for one who will question my equal humanity, claim me as his slave or offer me an insult. I am seated beside white people. I reach the hotel. I enter the same door. I am shown into the same parlor. I dine at the same table and no one is offended. A uh, more general question. We have talked a lot about uh, multi-channel installations, creating spaces, surroundings, multi-screens, and single channel. Um, do you, what is the main difference for you between the two the, concerning the same f film, the same work, the same subject? Well, you know, I mean, I think, I mean, I began sort of my sort of practice making songs. Interestingly enough, making multiple screen works, they were connected to um, experiments at the London Filmmakers Co-op, which was an experimental film space in London. And a lot of my professors made multiple screen works like Martin McGrath, Tina Keane, Peter Cadal. I mean, they belong to a whole movement, a structural film movement, or experimental film movement, which in a sense, I would say in my work, you know, there's a kind of, it's a kind of different genre, but I would say that in a way making multiple screen works for me, because I had also made films were a kind of excuse or alibi for making works in a gallery context, as opposed to a cinema context. So you could say the classicism of the cinema context, to a certain extent, demands single screen narration. And this is how we understand film. And in the gallery context, I wanted to play with time. And with the advert of new technologies, it was possible to make more than one screen and to have a more sculptural relationship to the image. And so initially with all the developments of new technologies, it just became really exciting to make multiple screen works. And I would say my theorizing around that was connected to theories around the gaze and just in a way the possibility to present these more sculptural forms of presentation for works. And it became an experiment. So I would say my laboratory and collaborations with Adam Finch, my editor, and um, sort of Tom Cullen, my installer, we basically just created a language, a language which other people were involved in, um, and that became a kind of genre, you could say. And so I think it's an idea of uniqueness, but also I think aesthetically, there's something that's going on, which is, the, if you like, the play of time and synchronization and all of these aspects that which is a kind of maybe a poetry i'm interested in the poetry of that as a language and i think that that is something which feels you know quite precious um to hold on to how many men there's, there's, there's a lot 25 people Right, they've been on the cockle bed, have they, Mark? And they're... Yeah, cockle bed's more from there. Can you please just... Are they okay? Are they on the bank? Have they got water? Are they okay? Have they got bike? Got bike? Have they got bike? Get them all out. Just people, no bike. Just people. Hello?